Hello, and welcome to this lecture where we will talk about the problem of overfitting, how to avoid overfitting and achieve a good generalization, and we will also mainly talk about regularization to avoid overfitting. First, let's talk about the problem of overfitting. Let's take this simple data set where we have houses characterized by their size, and then what we want to predict is the price of those houses. So this is the output. So this is a regression problem. So here we have three different models um, applied on the same data set. The first model is a very simple one. It's just a linear regression model. The second one is a polynomial of degree two. So it's a slightly more complex model than the previous one. And the third one is a much more complex model. So it's a polynomial of degree 10. So if, for example, you have 10 data points in this data set, then this line or this polynomial will go through all of them. So it's a very complex model. So now for this specific data set, which of these models is a good model and which one is, um, is not a good model? If we look at the first model, it's a very simple model. It's just a linear model. And we have just one feature, um, the size of the houses. And this model makes the assumption that the relation between the size and the price is linear. So it assumes that the housing prices will vary linearly with the prices. So it just fits um, a linear model to this data. But if you look at the data, the relation between the price and the size is slightly more complex than that, right? It's not a linear relation. So this simple model does not capture the complexity of the data. And in this case, we talk about underfitting. So in this case, the model makes a strong assumption that the price is, um, or the price varies linearly with the size, but ends up not fitting the training data um, very well. So the model is biased towards um, this assumption. So in this case, we talk about underfitting or uh, a model with a high bias. Now, if we look at the second model, it is slightly more complex than the first one, and it seems that it captures the complexity of the data um, in a good way. So it fits the data pretty well. But if we look at the third model, this one, it is a much more complex model than the two previous ones. So it's a polynomial of degree 10. And if, for example, you have 10 data points in your training data set, then a polynomial of this order will go actually through each of them, right? So such a model will achieve zero training error. So if you look at the mean squared error, then you'll see that it's zero. But this does not mean that this is a good model because it achieves a good performance only for this training data. But then if you apply it to new unseen data, which comes from the same distribution, um, then you will see that this model achieves um, a poor performance. It fits even the noise in the training data, but then it does not generalize well to new unseen data. And in this case, we talk about overfitting. And we say that the model has a high variance because the space of all possible hypothesis functions of this order is too large or too variable. So we cannot have, um, we do not have enough data points um, to construct such a hypothesis function of this type. So if we want to fit such a complex model to this data, then we need to collect more data. Okay, so here originally we have just one feature, x, which is the size of the house. But then you can see those additional terms as additional features. So for example, x, x squared is another feature, x to the power of three is another feature and so on. So you can see that when we have few data points compared to the number of features, so here we have a lot of features, but then few data points, then in this case, overfitting can happen 
So either we re reduce the number of features to get a simpler model, like for example this one, or if we want such a complex model, then we need to collect more data, um, if possible, more training data. Okay, so to summarize, for this data set, this is um, an example of a model of a good complexity, right? But if the model is too simple, then we talk about underfitting because it does not capture the complexity of the data. And if the model is too complex, then we talk about overfitting. And in both cases, I mean, um, underfitting and overfitting, the model will have a poor generalization performance um, when applied on the new data. For example, it will have a high generalization error or a low generalization accuracy. Okay, so what you should remember from this is that when your model is too complex, like, like this one, for example, uh, when it depends on a lot of parameters, like in this case we have 10 parameters um, or 11 parameters from theta 0 to theta 10. Um, so generally, the more parameters you have, the more complex is your model. So when the model is too complex or when your um, training data depends on too many features, right? then the learned model may fit the training data very well so it achieves um, basically zero mean squared error, like in this case. But when you apply it to new data, then it will fail to generalize, right? So if you compute something called um, the generalization error, we will see how to estimate this generalization error in few slides. But you, if you estimate it, then you will see that it's high in this case. And the same applies for classification too. So consider, for example, a logistic regression classifier. So here we have a simple linear model which depends on those two features, x1 and x2. And maybe such a simple model is not good enough to separate um, those two classes correctly um, or well enough. Now, if we add more polynomial terms, um, like more features, like x1 squared, um, x2 squared, x1 times x2, and so on, and do again logistic regression, then we will end up with a nonlinear model in this original uh, space, x1 and x2. Um, and maybe this model separates the two classes better than the first one. Now, if you add more polynomial features of higher, de higher order to your data, then you get a more and more complex model. Um, for example, you get this model, which actually separates the two classes uh, perfectly um, meaning that it fits the training data very well, so it achieves zero training error. But as we said previously, this is not necessarily good. So again, this classifier will have a good generalization accuracy or a low generalization error. But this classifier and this one will have a poor generalization performance. So for example, a low generalization accuracy. Here we talk about underfitting or a high bias and low variance. And here we talk about overfitting or a high variance and low bias. This picture summarizes a little bit what we were talking about. So the x-axis here represents the model complexity from low to high. And the y-axis here represents the prediction error and we have two curves here. Um, the blue one is the training error, and the red one is the test error. So the blue one is when you apply the model on the training data, the data on which this model has been trained, and then you compute the classification error or the mean squared error for regression, for example. And the red one is um, when you apply the model to new unseen data, right, new test data, and then compute the error on this test data. So generally, you can see that as you train the model, um, as the model becomes more and more complex, then the training error decreases, right? So if your model is very complex, then maybe you achieve close to zero error on this training data. But if you look at the test error, then it decreases as the model gets more and more complex. Uh, 
but then at some point it starts to increase again because from this point the model starts to be too complex and then we are overfitting so there is some good model complexity which leads to um, a good generalization error but to find what is the right model complexity you should not look at the training error because generally um, the training error decreases as the model gets more and more complex okay so when the model is too complex we talk about overfitting in other words um, low bias and high variance and when the model is um, has too low complexity is not complex is very simple then we talk about underfitting or high bias and low variance usually in the case of um, an overfitting the training error is very low but the the test error or also the generalization error um, is very high right and in the case of underfitting both the generally both the the training error and the test error are high. Okay, so what makes it more likely to overfit? Well, as we said previously, when you don't have enough training data points, then it's easier to overfit because then you will fit a model only to those data points that you saw so far. But if you test this model on um, more data that you collect later, then you will see that it's not good. Right. So it's easier to overfit when the, um, the number of training examples is too low, too small. And also when you have too many features relative to the number of data points in your training data set. Because when you have few data points and too many features, um, then there are not enough data points to observe all possible feature values um, in this high, feature, high dimensional feature space. So this also leads to overfitting. And maybe you also have enough data points and you also have um, few features, but then your model is very complex, right? It is way more complex than the complexity of your data. Then in this case, you also um, overfit. And when your model is way too simple and does not capture the complexity of the data, then you will probably um, underfit. Okay. Okay, so let's now talk about how you can have an estimation of the generalization error. So, as we explained previously, the training error is the error that the model achieves on the training examples. And this is not an estimation of the error that the model will have when it is deployed um, in real life and applied to new data. Okay. To do that, you have the generalization error, which is the error of the model on a new unseen data. And we can have an estimation of this using something called um, k-fold cross-validation. So this provides an estimation of the generalization error. And in general, the generalization error is um, higher than the training error. Okay, that's often the case because you fit your model to the training data, so the training error is probably smaller than the generalization error. So let's now talk about how to use the k-fold cross-validation to have an estimation of the generalization error. So suppose that you have all your data here, and then if you want, you can split it into a training data set and the test data. Um, for example, if you want to evaluate later how your model will um, perform when it is deployed and applied to new unseen, completely new unseen data. Um, so you can do that, but for now, let's focus on this part. So here you have your training data. And what you need to do to do k-fold cross-validation is to split this training data into k-folds. So you split it, you split it into k separate um, sub data sets or folds. And by the way, k here is just some parameter. Um, it is not the k that we talked about when we talked about the k nearest neighbors. That's that's a different k. It's just some parameter to define how many folds you want. Typically, people just use ten fold cross validation usually. Okay, so you split your training data into k folds and then you train a model on those parts and you apply it on this part. 
So you leave this part out, you keep it, and then you train a model on the remaining ones, those green parts, and then this model is applied to this, uh, to this part that you left out. And so you estimate the error of the model on this part. And then you repeat the same thing. You train a model, uh, you keep this part, and you train a model on the remaining ones, and then you apply it on this part and estimate um, the error. And same thing. You train a model on the green data, and you apply it to the blue data and estimate the error, and so on. You repeat this k times um, if you have k folds. So you will get k estimates of the errors. And then the generalization error is estimated as the average of these k errors. Or the generalization accuracy is estimated as the average of the k accuracies that you get um, each time. Or you can compute the generalization score um, based on any other score um, than the accuracy. And sometimes when your training data set is small, right, is too small, some people um, prefer to use something called the leave one out cross-validation. It is basically similar to the k-fold cross-validation, but um, it's a specific case where k is actually equal to n, um, where n is the number of training examples. So basically each time you leave one data point out and you train a model on the remaining, um, remaining data points. And then you test this model on the data point that you left and you repeat this n times. So this usually gives a better estimate when the training data set is small. Okay, and that's how we get an estimation of the generalization error. Now that we know how to estimate the generalization error and what is overfitting, let's see how to overcome this problem of overfitting. So far, you decided that a model is overfitting or not just by looking um, or visualizing the data and the model. But usually, it is very hard to visualize the model and even the data when you have more than two or three features, right? Um, because usually the data is characterized by much more uh, features, like usually thousands of features. So if we take this um, housing example, then Maybe you don't have just the size of the, the houses which affects their price. Maybe you have the number of bedrooms, a number of floors, the age of the house, the average income in, in the neighborhood, the kitchen size, and so on. So you can't really visualize the data and the model that you get. So how can we avoid overfitting in general um, when we have uh, multidimensional data? There are a number of ways with which you can avoid overfitting. The first one, which is very important and you should always do it, is hyperparameter tuning. Basically finding the best parameters or the best values for the hyperparameters of your model. And when I talk about hyperparameters, I'm not talking about the parameters theta that you need to learn. I'm talking about um, hyperparameters that you need to set. Um, like, for example, the k for k nearest neighbors, or the gamma or sigma parameter, hyperparameter that we used when we talked about um, kernel regression with the Gaussian kernel, or, for example, the depth of the decision tree, the maximum depth um, of the decision tree, and so on. So, for a given model, with different values of the hyperparameters, you get um, more or less complex models. So for example, for a decision tree, depending on different values of the maximum depth, you get a more or less complex decision tree. So to find the best hyperparameter values, you can try different values and then each time compute the generalization error, as we saw previously using k-fold cross-validation, and then keep the hyperparameters or the model that achieved um, the lowest generalization error. And you can also use the same thing to compare um, completely different models, like for example, um, a decision tree with um, a k-nearest neighbors, right? Okay, so hyperparameter tuning is very important. You should always do it, um, both for classification and regression. Another thing that you can do is to reduce the number of features. And that's if you have um, too many features. 
because as we said previously, we are more likely to overfit when the number of features is high compared or relative to the number of data points. So when you have, um, let's say, a small number of data points, but you have too many features, then you should reduce the number of features. Or if you can, you can collect more data points. So that's something you can do, um, depending on your data set. Um, but we will see a few methods that allows you to do dimensionality reduction or to do feature selection. Another thing that you can do is to use ensemble methods. For example, in some previous lecture, we saw that um, a decision tree can easily overfit. And to avoid this problem, we can use an ensemble of decision trees, uh, and it was called random forest. But more importantly, something that we can use to avoid overfitting is called regularization. We will see this in a few slides. But here, instead of selecting um, few, uh, the few more important features, we actually keep all the features. But we try to reduce the magnitude or the value of the, hyper, of the parameters, um, theta j. So we try to have a model that minimizes the cost, but it prefers small value for, for those parameters. We will see why and how to do this later. Um, but this works well when we have um, usually a lot of features and each feature contributes a little bit um, to predicting the output. So that's the most common way um, to avoid overfitting. But the first way you should always do it, it's not an option. In fact, we will see that when you do regularization, you will introduce an additional hyperparameter and you need to tune the value of this hyperparameter based on this. Okay, let's start with hyperparameter tuning. As we said previously, machine learning algorithms have what we call hyperparameters. And these are external parameters that we don't learn based on the training data. These are different from the parameters theta of the model that we learn based on the training data. So hyperparameters includes uh, things like the K for K nearest neighbors and so on. So we need to fine tune the values of those hyperparameters. In other words, we need to find um, the values of the hyperparameters that leads to a good model, not too simple and not too complex. And to do that, we do what we call a grid search over possible values of those hyperparameters. And each time we compute the generalization error based on the k-fold cross-validation. So we pick some values for our hyperparameters. And then we compute the generalization error using, let's say, the 10-fold cross-validation, as we explained it previously. And then we repeat this again and again with various values of the hyperparameters. And at the end, we keep the hyperparameters that give you um, the smallest generalization error, or the model that led to the smallest uh, to the smallest generalization error. So now you have the best hyperparameters, and then you can use them to train a model on your um, whole training data. And then you can test this final model on the test data that you left um, initially. Um, in order to see how your model will perform on completely new data uh, when it is deployed in real life. So this test data is data which hasn't been used for training and it hasn't been used as part of this hyperparameter tuning. So it simulates uh, real world data that you will receive in the future. Okay, and to do hyperparameter tuning, you don't really have to implement all those steps manually in Python. You can use the scikit-learn library, and then there is um, something called grid search CV, grid search cross-validation, which will do all the work for you. It will try different values of the hyperparameters that you specify, and then it will return the model and the hyperparameters which achieved um, the best performance. You will see this in um, some later labs. Now let's talk a little bit about feature selection. Suppose that we have a data set with a few data points, like for example, in this case, five data points. If we have originally just one feature, x1, which is the size of the houses, and then we add another feature, like x1 squared, 
So we get a polynomial model of degree 2. Then this model looks um, good enough for this data. But suppose that we add more and more features, um, polynomials uh, of degree 3 and 4, for example. Um, so we get more and more complex model, like, for example, this one. And you can see that this model, at some point, when you add too many features, then it starts to overfit and achieves zero accuracy, um, zero error on the training data. But this is basically overfitting. Today, it is very common to find data sets with a large number of features that can go from thousands to even millions of features. And as we said previously, large D compared to N, so D is the number of features and N is the number of data points. So a large D can lead to overfitting because then there is um, less likelihood of all possible features being observed during the training process. So in this case, what we can do is either collecting more data, so increasing um, the size of the data sets, but sometimes it is costly and not possible to collect much more data. So what we can do is to decrease D, reduce the number of features and select only the most important features. And so this will lead to a simpler model and also a faster training process because you have less features. OK, so let's now see some very basic ways to select features. One very simple and maybe naive way to do feature selection is just to remove the features which have a low variance. For example, suppose that you have some feature in your data set which always takes the same value regardless of the data point. Such a feature will have um, a low variance, in fact, a variance of zero, because this feature takes always the same value. So such a feature would not be useful, right? So we can remove it because it does not help differentiating between different data points. Okay, so in general, we can remove the features with the low variance. And this is an unsupervised feature selection uh, method because we don't use the labels or the outputs. We just look at the values of the features and remove the ones which have um, low variance. Another way to do feature selection, and this time it's a supervised feature selection method, um, is to do recursive feature elimination. Suppose, for example, that we have a model that assigns weights to features. So this is just a linear model, like you can see here, and the weights are just those uh, parameters values, the coefficients theta of a linear model. So based on such a linear model, a feature xj that have a small coefficient theta j is considered less important because it contributes um, less to this prediction. So in this case, we can say that we remove such a feature. So for example, if theta 3 is very small, very close to zero, then we can say that x3, this feature, is not very important. So we just remove it because um, this term does not contribute much to this prediction. And the way to do this elimination is as follows. So we just train a model using the initial set of features, right? All the features. And then we obtain the importance of, fe of each feature um, based on those coefficients, right? And then we remove the least important feature or features um, from the current set of features. And we repeat the same procedure with the current number of features. So again, we train a linear model, and then um, we take the least important feature, we remove it, and then we repeat the same process again and again until we achieve um, the desired number of features that we want to keep. And we can know what is the best um, number of features to keep at the end using cross-validation. So each time we remove um, a feature, right? We do k-fold cross-validation to evaluate the performance of the model, which is trained based on the current set of features that we kept. So until we see that the performance of the model starts to decrease, so we stop there and we don't remove features anymore. And again, you don't need to implement all this manually in Python. 
if you use the scikit-learn library, then there is this um, recursive feature elimination with cross-validation uh, already implemented there, so you can directly use it. So this eliminates features um, recursively, as we explained previously, and it has an automatic tune-in of the number of features selected. It uses um, k-fold cross-validation to automatically know uh, what's the best number of features to keep at the end. So for example, here we have the number of features that, that we keep, right? And this is basically the cross-validation accuracy. So by keeping this number of features, we achieve this um, generalization accuracy. Then if we decrease the features to 20, we achieve a higher accuracy because maybe we get simpler model and um, it overfits less. And by decreasing more and more the number of features, um, until we get three features, we see that we achieve a much higher accuracy, generalization accuracy. So having a very simple model based on three important features um, achieves uh, good generalization accuracy, uh, better generalization accuracy than having 25 features, for example. And then if you decrease the number of features more, for example, to two or one, you see that the, the performance decreases very much. So you can just pick three. You will also see this in some future lab. Another way to estimate the features importance is to use tree-based models, for example, decision tree or random forest. Because if we take a decision tree, at each node, it makes um, a decision to split based on one feature. And by making this split, it decreases the impurity. By splitting again here, it decreases again the impurity of the subregions that we get. So we can actually estimate how much each feature decreases the impurity um, in the tree. And this will give us some kind of importance for this feature. Um, if you have a feature which on average decreases the impurity more than uh, another feature, then the first feature is more important, right? And random forest does the same thing. And it takes the average features importance across the trees in the ensemble. So again, in scikit-learn, if, for example, you train a decision tree classifier, right? So you instantiate it, you train it on your training data, X and the outputs Y. <clears throat> then you have an attribute called feature importance, which returns the importance of each feature. And you have the same thing for um, random forest and other tree-based models. One very important way to avoid overfitting is to use regularization. So let's talk about this. So suppose here that we have a model which fits this training data in a good way. And here we have a much more complex model because we added those um, additional terms. And this model overfits the data. So it has a poor generalization performance. Suppose that we want to make the value of those parameters very small um, in order to get a simple model which looks like this one. And to do this, suppose that we define our cost function as follows. So this is just the usual mean squared error. But then we added this part here. So our cost function now is all this. So we want to minimize this in new cost function. Uh, we want to find the parameters theta that leads to the minimum possible value for all this. So this part that we added here makes this cost very high, right? And the only way to minimize this cost or to make this cost um, smaller is to choose a small value for theta three and theta four. So by adding this part to our cost function and then minimizing all this, we are actually telling it to prefer small values for those um, parameters. So it minimizes the values of those parameters, but it also minimizes the mean squared error that we defined here. So if it can achieve a small mean squared error with um, small parameters, then it will prefer this. So if we do this in this case, um, it will prefer a model which looks like this. 
because it sets um, those parameters theta3 and theta4 to um, something very close to zero. And by doing that, still the model that we get achieves a low mean squared error, like this one. Having small values for the parameters implies a simpler model, and therefore it is less prone to overfitting. So instead of just using the mean squared error as our cost function, we add this um, regularization term um, in order to prefer small values for the parameters theta j. And this lambda is a hyperparameter which is called the regularization parameter. So we need to do hyperparameter tuning in order to, to tune um, the value of this hyperparameter. And the value of lambda affects how much we want to regularize our um, parameters. So lambda controls the trade-off between two objectives. The first objective is to fit the training data well. So we want our predictions to be as close as possible to the true outputs. And the second objective tries to keep um, the parameters small. So we want to keep the model simple. Now let's see what is the relation between lambda and overfitting or underfitting. Or in other words, what happens when lambda is too small or too large. Suppose that lambda is too small. For example, extreme case, it is equal to zero. Then this cost function becomes our original cost function, which is just um, the mean squared error. And so overfitting can happen depending on the characteristics of our data set. For example, if we have too few samples and um, a large number of features, then overfitting may happen. And if lambda is set to an extremely large value, then we may have underfitting. Because when lambda is very large, then the way to minimize this function is to set the value of those parameters, theta j, um, very close to zero. And so in this example, we will end up with um, a hypothesis function, which is always equal to theta zero. So we will get just um, a line, and this is pure underfitting. And notice here that when we, we do regularization, we are regularizing the parameters starting from theta one. So we are not regularizing theta zero. And this is just by convention. So if you want to regularize theta zero also, so that's fine. But this is not necessary because um, theta zero is not multiplied by any feature value, unlike the other parameters. So it's fine if we don't regularize theta zero. Okay, so when lambda is too small, we can still have overfitting. And when it is too large, then we can have underfitting. So it is very important to fine tune the value of this hyperparameter lambda. You should try several values for lambda and each time estimate the generalization error, as we saw previously using um, k-fold cross-validation, and then take the value which leads to the minimum um, estimated generalization error. And you can do that using grid search CV in scikit-learn. In a previous lecture, we studied linear regression just by minimizing the mean squared error or the sum of squared errors. And this was um, called ordinary least squares or ordinary linear regression. And this was a non-regularized uh, regression. So based on what you saw today, you can have a regularized version of this. And this is done by minimizing exactly the cost function that we saw earlier. So it has this regularization term. And you can, of course, write this cost um, in a more compact way. For example, like this one. Or to have exactly the same cost function as this one, we can also multiply by 1 over 2n. So this part here, x theta, corresponds to the vector of predicted outputs, and y corresponds to the vector of true outputs. So this is the distance squared between those two vectors. It corresponds exactly to the sum of the squared errors.
And theta hat here is the vector of all parameters except theta zero, because we don't regularize um, theta zero. So j starts from one. And this part here is the L2 norm of this vector. So this is the L2 norm of this vector squared, uh, and it corresponds exactly to this part. So a linear regression which minimizes this cost regularized by the L2 norm is sometimes called ridge regression. And we can also use other kinds of regularization here. For example, we can use the L1 norm, um, in which case this will be called the lasso regression. So we can use this, the L1 norm. And this will be the sum over the absolute value of the parameters um, instead of the parameter value squared. And so if we use this L1 norm uh, for regularization, then this will be called the lasso regression instead of the ridge regression. And those have slightly different properties. For example, the lasso regression with this regularization will give a solution theta where most of the theta j are very close to zero. So it gives a more sparse solution um, compared to the ridge regression. And if you compute the derivative of the previous cost function with respect to each theta j, then you will get this. And the derivative of the cost function with respect to theta zero is given here, since theta zero was not regularized. So this part here corresponds to what we saw previously. Um, it's the derivative of the cost function with respect to each theta j for the mean squared error cost that we saw previously. And when it's a regularized cost, then you get this part in addition. So based on that, you can use gradient descent to minimize the cost and find the best parameters, um, theta j. And you can rewrite this gradient update rule uh, and simplify it like this. So this is exactly the same as this one. But maybe this one is easier to remember because it consists of those two parts. So this part here is exactly what we saw um, in a previous lecture uh, about linear regression. So it's just the derivative of the mean squared error cost um, with, with respect to theta j. And this part here tries to keep some ratio of the current value of theta j. And as we said in the previous lecture about linear regression, you can minimize the cost function directly without um, using gradient descent. Um, you can use the so-called normal equation and get the solution theta directly. And we saw that the way to get this is to compute the derivative of the cost function and set it equal to zero and then solve um, to find theta. Because we know that the derivative of the, at the minimum of the cost function is equal to zero. So we just set the derivative equal to zero and then solve for theta. Now we can do the same thing with the regularized version of the cost. And what we will get at the end is this. Um, it looks very similar to this one, with the exception of this part here. And as we said in the previous lecture, if the data matrix X is too big, for example, you have a lot of features, then computing this part here will take a lot of time. So if you have a huge data matrix X, um, you can preferably use gradient descent instead of this. We also studied previously a non-regularized version of logistic regression for classification. Let's now see a regularized version of logistic regression. Again, suppose that I have a complex model like this one, which depends on a lot of parameters. Then to avoid overfitting and get simpler classification model, we can add a regularization term to our cost function. And the cost function that we used previously for logistic regression is this one. This is the cross entropy cost. So now we have this L2 regularization term. 
and we can use gradient descent to minimize this cost um, as we did previously. So the derivative of the cost function with respect to each parameter theta j will be this one. And here h of x is the logistic or sigmoid function. 